Um, yeah, it is wonderful to know that the cross, the cross takes away all sin. There's nothing, there's nothing that the blood of Jesus does not cover. So no matter what you've done, no matter what's happened in your life, no matter whatever, you know, whatever it is that you're facing, the blood of Jesus is more powerful than any of that. And we're just good to be reminded of it. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can worship you. We can praise you. We can declare who you are into the heavenly realm. It lifts our spirits and also releases your presence into the world. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for your word. And as we come to look at your word now, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds to hear from you. And Lord, let these words that you've given me speak to each one of us the thing that you want each one of us to hear. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence with us now. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your power and your presence here this morning. Thank you, Father, that you've made this all possible. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We started this series on lessons from the life of David on the 17th of September last year. We had a slight pause over Advent and uh, Christmas. And I picked it up again last week, looking at 1 Samuel chapter 30, where David is sent back to Ziklag by the Philistine supreme commander from potentially fighting against Saul and his army. And upon returning to Ziklag, David and his 600 men discover that uh, Ziklag has been, been raided and all their families and possessions have been taken. David averts a rebellion by his disgruntled men, and then they pursue the Amalekite raiders catch up to them and destroy all except 400 of the raiding party who managed to get away. And if it said just 400 was a small part of it, it must have been a very large raiding party where there was just a portion of them that escaped. They recover all their wives and children and possessions plus other possessions that the Amalekites had taken from other cities they had raided. And then they head back to Ziklag. Now while David is pursuing the Amalekites, the Philistines fight against Saul, his three sons and the Israelite army, and they defeat them, killing Saul's three sons and leaving him severely wounded, which forces him to die by falling on his own sword because his armor bearer would not kill him and he did not want to be captured by the Philistines. So after the death of Saul, when David had returned from striking down the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. And on the third day, behold, a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. And when he came to David, he fell to the ground and paid homage. David said to him, where do you come from? And he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, how did it go? Tell me. And he answered, the people fled from the battle. And also many of the people have fallen and are dead. And Saul and his son Jonathan are also dead. Then David said to the young man who told him, How do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? And the young man who told him said, By chance I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, and there was Saul leaning on his spear. And behold, the chariots and the horsemen were close upon him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called to me. And I answered, Here I am. And he said to me, Who are you? I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said to me, Stand beside me and kill me. For anguish has seized me, and yet my life still lingers. So I stood beside him and killed him, because I was sure that he would not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the armlet that was on his arm, and I brought them here to my Lord. Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. And David said to the young man who told him, Where do you come from? And he answered, I am the son of a sojourner and a Malachi. David said to him, How is it 
you were not afraid to put your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed. Then David called one of the young men and said, Go execute him. And he struck him down so that he died. And David said to him, Your blood be on your head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 to 16. If you read the account of Saul's death in 1 Samuel 31, you'll see that Saul was not killed by the Amalekite, but he had fallen on his sword to kill himself after his armor-bearer refused to kill him. He fell on his sword rather than, than be captured by the Philistines. So why does this Amalekite come to David with the crown and armlet and tell David that he had killed Saul at his request? Was he telling the truth or was he making up a story? Why would there be two different accounts of Saul's death? Is this a mistake in the Bible, a problem with the translation of the text over the years? Or is there another reason? The account recorded in 1 Samuel 30 is correct. Saul did fall on his sword in order not to be captured alive. This Amalekite is telling David a lie, but why would he do this? He does it to try to ingratiate himself to David and hopes for material gain of some sort, not knowing the respect and honor that David showed towards Saul as the anointed king of Israel. He knew Saul and David were at odds with one another, and he thought this would help him to win favor with David. Instead of receiving something from David, he is killed because he claimed to have killed the Lord's anointed. Telling lies to try and win favor with someone is not a good thing to do. Always rather speak the truth. Now David does not celebrate the death of King Saul, but rather he mourns, weeps and fasts until evening. And then he writes a lament about Saul and Jonathan. We don't have time to read it now, but it's the rest of the first chapter of uh, 2 Samuel 1. David is heartbroken by the news of the death of Saul and Jonathan. After this, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. David said, To which shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. So David went up there, and his two wives also, Aonom of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David brought up his men who were with him, every one with his household, and they lived in the towns of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. When they told David it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul, David sent messages to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, May you be blessed by the Lord because you showed this loyalty to Saul your Lord and buried him. Now may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you, and I will do good to you because you have done this thing. Now therefore let your hands be strong and be valiant, for Saul, your Lord, is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. After the death of Saul, and at a time of mourning, David inquires of the Lord what his next move should be. He does not just head up to Jerusalem and proclaim himself as king. He waits on the Lord and hears from the Lord what he is to do next. The Lord gives him instructions and David follows them. This leads to David being anointed as king, but only as king over Judah, not the rest of Israel. In the time that David was inquiring of the Lord, Abner, the commander of Saul's army, took the remaining son of Saul, Ishbosheth, and made him king over the rest of Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel. And he reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. There was conflict between David and Ishbosheth because David did not see Ishbosheth as the anointed king of Israel, who was like his father Saul had been. But he did acknowledge that he was a righteous man. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul became weak, weaker and weaker. 
A number of events transpire where there are false accusations and devious plottings, misunderstandings, assassinations, and executions that end up with Abner and Ishbosheth both dead, which, David, which leads to David being approached to be the king of all Israel. Bible scholars believe there was a period of time between Ishbosheth being killed and the approach to David to be king. And during this period of waiting, David did not try to force the issue, but waited and trusted in the Lord. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, You shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and at Jerusalem he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Finally, David is anointed as king over all Israel and begins to reign over all Israel. Now David was anything between 10 and 13 years old when Samuel anointed him with the oil to be the next king of Israel, replacing Saul, because Saul had obeyed the Lord's commands and the Lord took the anointing of king from him and gave it to David. David carried that anointing all those years, anything between 17 and 20 years. And during most of those years, he served Saul faithfully as a musician, a soldier, a son-in-law, and not once did David do anything to expedite the demise of Saul and his, and his inauguration as king. He did the opposite. He protected Saul and prevented others from harming him. Twice he had the opportunity to kill him. Now how many of us would have the patience and servant-heartedness of David to serve Saul all those years while waiting to take your rightful place as king? How many of us? Patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit. And I learned this in my walk with the Lord. I got saved when I was 19 years old. Six weeks later, I went off to the army to do my compulsory military service. About four months after being saved, I felt God say to me that He was calling me to serve full-time in, in ministry, that I'd be in full-time ministry. I spoke to the army chaplain and his wife about this, and they both affirmed this calling on my life. I wasn't sure where or when it would happen. And as I grew in my faith, finished my time in the army and began work, I explored various avenues of theological studies. But nothing I looked at felt like the right thing to do. No doors opened up. I got involved in the church serving on the sound team, I then got invited to be part of a ministry group that did sound for gospel concerts and some local and national Christian festivals. This led to the establishment of a business selling and installing sound systems as a means to support the ministry group. There were some changes in the leadership of, of the church, and after a time of exploring options, the church became part of a group of churches that is very similar to the Vineyard Movement. It was very focused on seeing the kingdom of God spreading across to the nations um, around the world. And the way to do that was through church planting and going to the, na the nations to make disciples of all nations. Does that sound similar to the vineyard? <laughs> Very much like that. There was a lot of regular teaching and training by the various senior leaders of the movement in the various regions of South Africa. And there was an annual leadership training time. Very much like the vineyard leaders gathering. During this time, I'd met and married Jill. Within a couple of years, we had two children, had bought our first house, and were serving in various ways in the church. We were then invited to be part of a church plant out of this church in Durban to a village about 20 miles inland from there. We had just moved into our dream house in that area and knew that God had put us there in that house so that we could be part of that church plant. During these years, there had been a number of words and confirmations that I was called to be in full-time ministry. But nothing had opened up yet. 
A few years later, I was, one of, I was at one of the leadership training times, and during one of the sessions, the pastor was teaching, was speaking about going to the nations. He had been our pastor in Durban. He was the one that married Jill and I. We knew him very well. And while he was preaching, he stopped and he said, the Holy Spirit has just laid in my heart that he's speaking to people's lives right now as to where they are to go and church plant. And I felt God call me to go and church plant in Malawi. I knew nothing about Malawi, but felt that this was God speaking. After speaking to Jill about it, and then also speaking to our pastor and a number of the other senior leaders, the doors opened up for us to go to Malawi and church plant. God first spoke to me about full-time ministry when I was 20. We moved to Malawi to church plant when I was 36. There was a 16-year period of waiting, serving, learning, preparing, and trusting the Lord to open the doors, and then it happened. In all that time, I never tried to force a door open or push my way into a position. I waited and trusted in the Lord. That was nearly 28 years ago, and God has been faithful to us ever since. I think we have wonderful stories to tell of what God has done in us and through us in these past 28 years, and even before that. David waited even longer than I did before he stepped into the anointing that had been poured out on him as a young lad. But in all that time he served, he learned, he prepared, he trusted the Lord. He never complained or tried to force things to happen, and he wouldn't let anyone else try to make it happen either. He honored Saul as his king and as God's anointed one this whole time. There's something else that I can think of that, uh, can, there's someone else I can think of that has lived nearly all their adult lives serving the one who they would one day replace. Always honoring that person and never doing, sorry, never doing anything to change the status quo. And that is this man formerly known as Prince Charles, our current monarch, King Charles III. He has been, for the most part, a great example of someone with patience who has waited a long time to fulfill the calling on his life. And he honored his mother at all times as the queen. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit, a sign of the Spirit of God being in your life. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 25. Can we be like David and trust God to fulfill the promises He has made to us? To have the patience to wait for them to come to pass and not to try to force things when they don't seem to be happening when we want them to happen. Jesus was also patient and waited before he stepped into ministry. If you think as a 30-year-old man, he was about 30 when he began his ministry. He could have maybe started at 20, but he waited until the time was right. Can we be like that as well? And don't force things to happen and wait and be patient and be like these men. Amen. Some discussion questions. First one, what stood out for you in this message? What touched your heart? What did God say to you through this? What promise or promises have you seen God fulfill in your life? Share those. They're always great to, to encourage someone where you've had a promise that God has made to you and you see, see it fulfilled. Also share some of the ones you're still waiting to see fulfilled. Then how easy do you find it to wait for God to fulfill a promise He has made to you? And then pray for one another. For those of you online, thank you for being with us. I trust that you'll look at these questions and uh, discuss them if you're with someone.